We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us on this wonderful Sabbath day. And there's a lot going on this weekend. It's Mother's Day weekend. That's right. We I... are so appreciative of our moms, current, past. I know everyone is in a different situation with the mom thing, but Definitely. we are very appreciative of our mothers. Also, this weekend, it's honoring our healthcare workers as well. So there's gonna be some special things in service. A couple of big things, healthcare <laughs> and then moms. Moms, do, and there's yeah. gonna be some uh, things handed out for those of you here in the congregation. So it's a very special mm -hmm. Sabbath. We've got a lot going on, other things as well. So take it away, Joelle. This weekend, today actually, at five o'clock, we have our annual spring concert in the sanctuary. And the whole theme, Stu, is based on on the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, songs of the soul. And we will have tenor soloist Randall Bills, our choir and the orchestra. It's gonna be fantastic. Come join us again, five o'clock this afternoon, right here in the sanctuary. Now, next Sabbath, we have a pop-up parent talk. It'll be during Sabbath school time. It's a great opportunity to learn how to better connect with your kids. There will be a guest speaker. It is free to attend, but you do need to register. So go to our website, LOUC.org to do that. Also next week, we have our very special uh, memorial service. Here is Pastor Adrian to just give you a little bit of the scoop on that. Happy Sabbath, family. There's nothing more heartbreaking than losing a loved one. One week from today, on May 20th, we will have our annual memorial service, which honors the lives of those who have passed on and encourages loved ones left behind. Our theme this year is Forever Loved. This service promises to bring comfort, support, and encouragement to those of you who have lost a precious loved one. Psalms 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to those who have a broken heart. Our next announcement is just a quick reminder. Our quilting ministry is getting back together again next Sunday. That's the 21st and 22nd, so Sunday and Monday. If you're interested in that, they'd love to have you come and help. We have a lot going on with our You Reach ministry. We love them. So many ways to get involved. Well, here is a quick update. Take a look. Good morning. I have a quick announcement for you this morning, and that is that our student pantry is now open and we are in need of food donations and of volunteers. You'll see here on the screen some information about what days we're open and the times, but if you'd like to donate or sign up to volunteer, please make sure you visit our website, youreachlluc.com. We really need your help and we appreciate you helping us with the student pantry and with our You Reach ministry overall. Thank you so much and have a blessed Sabbath. Our senior ministry has a wonderful trip planned. Um, it is to the Huntington Gardens and Library. It is on the 24th, but a couple of things to note, there is a fee involved and there is limited seating. And so you do need to register and you need to register by the 16th. But that's a great trip on the 24th to Huntington Library and the gardens there. You're not gonna wanna miss it. You can go to our website for more detailed information or you can call the church office to take care of arrangements. Well, we also have things for the kids. VBS is coming up. We love our kids. We love them on campus. And here is a video of what you can expect come June. You kids shuttle. We have your next mission. Where are we off to? Where's our next mission? What, we're not gonna find until we get there? Engineers ready? Reporting for duty. Astronauts, are you ready? Yes, ready for duty. Little Lieutenant. Are you ready? We pull it for Denny. Wait, buddy! Ready the engineer bay. T minus five. Four. Three. Two. One. We have lift off. You got a monkey in here. Where exactly are we? Where is this? Astronauts, are you ready to report for Stellar VBS? Stellar VBS? What's that? 
Is it a plan to cut Stella? Whatever it is, I'm excited. It looks really cool. We are ready to shine, shine Jesus light. light. That's one small step for kids, one giant leap for Jesus. You're invited to our next mission, Stellar VBS, June 11 through 15. Really excited about our next announcement. It's the Loma Linda Institute of Worship. It's going to be launched in August. Here's Pastor Adriana and Josh to tell us more. Hello, church family. My name is Adriana Pereira, and I serve as the director of worship and musical arts here at Loma Linda University Church. And I'm here with my friend, Josh Jameson, who is a modern worship pastor, and we have some great news to share with you today. We are so excited to let you know that we are going to be launching our Loma Linda Institute of Worship this August. And we have been, we've been praying about it, we've been dreaming about this, and finally we have the opportunity to, to be launching, and not only launching this institute, but specifically launching our Worship Leader Certificate that's going to be happening August 9 to 12. This certificate is designed for worship leaders, music directors, pastors, musicians, really anyone interested in worship. And we will be exploring biblical foundations of worship and biblical foundations of worship leadership. We have amazing workshops like music production, vocal technique, how to lead worship, exploring the biblical principles of worship, and so much more. We will also have two big concerts Stu Green and the Heritage Singers will be with us here at the Malina University Church. We'll be singing with them, and Ken Kirkland himself will be conducting the orchestra. So this will be great opportunity to make music together, worship together, and share the message of Jesus together. So if you want to know more about this opportunity, make sure to check out our Facebook page or our website. You can find all the information, uh, the schedule, how to register. Uh, make sure to also share it with your family and friends. Si hablas español, puedes ir a nuestra página web lliw.net y verás una sección en español con toda la información. Tenemos gente de México, de Colombia, de Argentina, de España que está viniendo y van a también tener el certificado en español. Esperamos que tú también vengas y conoces a alguien que esté interesado, por favor, invítalo. Gracias. So we want to invite you to come out to the Loma Linda Institute of Worship in August, and we hope to see you there. Our next announcement is an extra special one in that we are celebrating 50 years of handbell choir here at the Loma Linda University Church. The handbell spring concert next Sabbath, May 20 at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. And in addition to all the celebration, we're gonna be featuring the world premiere of a brand new composition by Matthew Compton. It's entitled, Neither Angels, Nor Demons, Nor Powers. You're not gonna to wanna to miss it. The handbell spring concert next Sabbath, right here in the sanctuary at 5 p.m. Well, as you can see, there's a lot going on. And for the latest information, go to our website, LLUC.org. <laughs> We hope you're doing well. We know the week was probably long with challenges, but we're praying you through it. We hope you have a wonderful Sabbath day. Blessings. Hallelujah. 
Happy Sabbath, everyone. Oh, we can do better than that. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Left Gift Pro Musical, another hearty amen for such a wonderful job. Amen, amen, amen. We welcome each of you this morning to this wonderful church service here at Loma Linda University. You look so beautiful. Your smiles look so beautiful. If you really feel good about how you look today, turn to your neighbor and say, I look good. <laughs> okay, enough of that. Enough of that. Okay, now, so that you don't get a big head and we have to come and anoint you, turn to your neighbor and say, and so do you. <laughs> amen, amen. Amen. We welcome each of you here today, as well as those of you who are watching online or the internet, wherever you are in the world. We want you to know we appreciate you, and especially those of you who are sick in the hospital, those who cannot be here. You're part of our family. We love you, and we miss you, and we're praying for you. You know, Pastor Doug, this is a special weekend. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. Amen. Amen. If you are a mother, stand up on your feet right now. We want to just give recognition to you. Stand up on your feet right now. Let's give a hearty amen for our wonderful mothers in the house today. Amen. Amen. And we also want to say this for all of our mothers who are watching online. And to my own mother who's watching online in Huntsville, I love you, Mom. I hope you were standing when I said stand to amen. So, <laughs> all right. Now, you know, we have a special gift for you. It's a small token of appreciation. When you leave the service today and you go through the back doors there, there will be someone there to hand out a gift to you. But one little thing, you've got to stay to the end of the service to get it. So leaving early, they won't give it to you. So you've got to complete the service first. <laughs> Amen. And in light of that, we know that many of you are sad during this time because your mothers have passed on. And we want to just emphasize again the service next week, put your honor the lives of those who have, have passed during this past year. Um, Pastor Doug. It's good to have you and Brother Andy with us now. Give us a special announcement right now. Thank you, Pastor Adrian. We have a lot to celebrate all day, and one of those things is our Pathfinders group. Friends, I don't know if you see them enough, but our Pathfinder group is dynamic, a group right. of uh, young people from 10 years old to 15 years old. I see previous Pathfinder directors in our audience this morning. And it has been on solid ground for many, many years. Amen. And uh, this is our, if you haven't met him yet, this is our director, Andy Nadella. And I just love this man because he makes sure that it goes well, that our kids are safe, and that the main thing is the main thing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Doug. And it gives me an honor to be a, a director for the Loma Linda University Pathfinder Club. Uh, and this year, we'll be finishing out our year next week with our uh, investiture. And uh, this year alone, we had approximately 45 Pathfinders who were part of this Amen. church club. Uh, and as you will see in the slide that's coming up right now on the screen, uh, that is our club, that is our Pathfinder family, and there are many Pathfinder parents in the audience. So we, we're grateful to have this club at this church. And uh, also, I just want to say something that's going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, it, we are going to open up enrollment a little bit earlier this year, so in, throughout the summer, and then we're going to start our Pathfinder year the same time that we start out our school year. So I'm going to suggest also that if you have maybe an adventurer that's ready to go on to Pathfinders, that you look into enrolling them as we will be beginning at the beginning of the school year. On a bigger note, we have uh, an international camporee that's coming up. Uh, in 2024. Some of you remember it as uh, the um, um, Oshkosh. Oshkosh. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> you remember it's Oshkosh, but now it's going to be at a different location. It's going to be in Gillette, Wyoming. And uh, as you see on the screen, you know, it's uh, August 5th to the 11th. And as I speak about this uh, international campery, we are looking forward to having Loma Linda University Church be one of the clubs representing Southeastern California Amen. Conference. So as I say that, uh, we solicit your prayers and we solicit your support in many ways as we try to make this a reality for our young people. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andy. So two headlines. Pathfinders this coming year is opening earlier, same time as school. And also, we solicit your support for our big campery next year. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Welcome, welcome to worship. You may stand for the hymn of praise.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Our gracious Father in heaven, as we have just sung to praise to your name, we join in glad adoration. We're blessed by your unconditional love and mercy. With gratitude in our hearts, we cr come before you now. We don't want to appear smug in our relationship with you. We know that at times we have failed and disappointed you, and we're sorry for that. So we pray as King David did, create in me a clean heart, O God, and restore, re renew a right spirit within me. Today we remember those who can't be here to worship with us in person. If they're ill, recovering from surgery or accident, be close to them where they are, at home or in the hospital. Today, as we recognize and honor our healthcare workers, we're thankful for their faithful and caring service and the sacrifices and long hours that they have to put in. We also remember the families of those who have gone to their rest, awaiting the call of the life giver. Be with them and give them comfort and strength for tomorrow as they await that great resurrection morning. And we pray for Dr. Schwelt as he speak, opens your word, we are confident that you have given him a word from the Lord. And so open our hearts to receive the message for us. And Lord, we pray for our church locally and globally, our country and the world that is in such a mess. We know how much we need you. But most of all, we just want to see Jesus and be with him throughout all eternity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, hello. Today, uh, this is the time in our service where you get to participate in a unique way. It is time for our tithes and offerings. Uh, first of all, I just want to mention that we are so blessed by your gifts and by your giving. Um, your offerings um, stay here. Uh, your tithes go to support our global um, conference and our global church. And we are truly blessed by how we know you support this church. Um, I'd like to uh, say a little prayer um, for you as you give, uh, that you would be blessed as you give, and that the funds that are received are especially used for what God has for them, for the purposes that God has as you give. So as you prepare to give today, let's... Let's just turn our hearts toward God and have a quick prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath. Thank you for each person that is here. Thank you, Lord, for their generosity. I pray, Lord, that you will help to prepare our hearts, not only for worship, but worship in this unique way of stewardship and being able to give back uh, monetarily. So Heavenly Father, please bless each person as they decide what and how to give and in what ways. And Lord, as we receive as a church, Lord, please guide our leadership and uh, those as a part of ministries to use uh, your resources in a way that you know would best reach your people. We love you and thank you that we can pray this in Jesus' name. Once again, thank you so much for giving. Happy Sabbath.
why don't we give them a hand? I don't know how blessed we are, but I know that we are truly blessed. Blessed to have our students, blessed to have our academy, blessed to have programs like ProMusica. There's a programming shift in your bulletin. There will be no lambs offering today. Instead, we want to give you something. If your spirit is being moved to give those dollars, then perhaps this week you would consider giving to Pastor Randy's taco fund. <laughs> Pastor Randy really, really likes tacos. We are celebrating you who are healthcare workers on the Sabbath. And we are doing so because during the pandemic, you got a lot of notoriety. And you were unflinching the true hands and feet of Jesus. But we know that there is another epidemic occurring, and that epidemic is particularly affecting our healthcare workers. They have higher incidence of burnout, anxiety, depression than the median uh, community. And so today we want to say to you, our dear, dear healthcare workers, we love you and we see you. And we have something for you. Janine Cochran came up with this idea, and Janine just wanted to spoil you. And so she baked cookies for you. So I want to give a hand to our dear Janine, who is probably hating this. But thank you, Janine, for spending so much time in the kitchen. Now, here's the problem. If all those cookies don't get eaten, then the pastoral staff has to eat them. And so I am going to ask if you are a healthcare provider, a healthcare worker, if you are busy in the task of being Jesus' hands and feet, won't you stand? We have something to give you today. As our friends from Pro Music uh, are delivering those to you, I want to share a little existential problem I had this week. So, so many of you have greeted me and said, congratulations, as most of you know, I finished my school, but this isn't about me. It's about this existential crisis I had. I was flying back from Portland, and you know that when you're signing your ticket, and uh, it says to state your title. And so I was really tempted to put Dr. and Mrs. Miguel Mendez. Because let's face it, when else does a doctor of theology get to refer himself as doctor? And so I wanted to do that with every fiber of my being. And then Linda, who is much smarter than I am, said, um, what happens if there's a medical emergency on board? Somebody's going to say, hey, in road 24B, there's a physician. And really, the only time you want to call a pastor on an airplane is if the airplane is going down. <laughs> and so I decided instead to fill out my name, Mr. and Mrs. Miguel Mendez. But there's no off button for our healthcare workers, is there? Whether it's on vacation, or whether it's immersed in a hospital setting, or a long-term setting, or an acute setting, you truly, truly work to bring forth the mission of this institution, which is to make human beings whole. It strikes me that when Jesus healed in the Gospels, the question that he asked isn't, do you want a solution to be found for your malady? Instead, time and time again, to the sick, Jesus said, would you be made whole? And the answer came time and time again, yes. And so if you are a healthcare worker and a member of this church, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for continuing the teaching and healing ministry of Christ. We want to thank you for breathing wholeness into people's lives. 
And so I want to invite us to consider our healthcare workers one more time as we pray for you in whatever setting you are serving. God, we want to praise you. We want to praise you because your ideal goal for humanity is wholeness. And wholeness is embodied in the ministry of medical professionals that come and incarnate you. Women and men who stand by a bedside, who would put a cold compress on somebody's forehead, who will hold a hand during the night, and who will listen to cries that so often go unheard. For women and men that speak hope and healing into the lives of those who are broken and brokenhearted, for them we say, thank you, Lord. Grant them the strength that they need to continue and allow us as a community to be supportive of their ministries, we pray in your name, in the name of our divine doctor, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've got a couple friends of mine, Faith and Allison, who are going to tell us a wonderful story about what happens in a hospital and what you kiddos can do there. So let's give them their time. All right, boys and girls, come on up. I know we don't have our stairs and steps, but we have space here. And then we have some space here in the pews. I'm gonna set some stuff up while you guys are coming. And I have Faith here with me. She's gonna be helping me. You guys can sit here or here. No, we can't sit up here, but just down here on the floor. Come on up. You can sit right here. All right, have a seat, guys. All right. So, how many of you have had an adult in your life say, imagine and put yourself in someone else's shoes? Has anyone heard that saying before, put yourself in someone else's shoes? What do you think that means? Right here, Faith. Um, it means um, to uh, imagine what they're uh, experiencing in their life. Exactly, to imagine what they're experiencing in their life. And that today is what we're going to be talking about, something called empathy. So empathizing means we're going to picture what it's like to be like someone else, right? So I'm going to hold up a pair of shoes and I'm going to tell you a story. Now, do you think any of you could fit in these shoes? Could you put yourself in these shoes? Your sister could, maybe your sister could, but none of us could really actually do that, right? So as I tell you the story, I want you to be thinking, thinking about what the person I'm gonna tell you might be feeling, okay? These shoes belong to a little one-year-old named Johnny. And Johnny went to his normal doctor appointment. The doctor listened to his heart and to his lungs, maybe took his temperature and everything was fine. Doctor leaves and the nurse comes in and what does she have in her hand? Mm, a shot. So I want you to raise your hand and tell me what you think little Johnny, who's one year old, sees or thinks and feels as he sees the nurse. Faith is going to come around with a microphone. Let's go over here, Faith. Let's try and mix it up. Go ahead. Tell us on the microphone. What do you think little Johnny's feeling? Scared. Scared. He might be feeling scared. Anyone else have another emotion? Right here. Okay, go ahead. Um... He might be um, scary. Yeah, it might be scary, right? So what do you think we could do to help little Johnny? Because he's scared. What could we do? Right here, um, okay. Help. You could help him, right? Maybe hold his hand or help him to tell him that it's going to be over really quick and it's for, it's for him to um, be healthy, right? All right, so I have another pair of shoes. I have two pairs of shoes for this one. Lizzie, who's five years old, brought her slippers. 
to the hospital, and she's been in the hospital for a couple of weeks now, but she also brought her go-home shoes, and these are the shoes that she's gonna put on today that she gets to leave the hospital. Except for the doctor came in and told Lizzie and her parents, today's not the day. We're gonna have to stay for a little bit longer and do some more tests. How do you think Lizzie might feel? Go ahead, Faith. Scared. Scared, what else? Disappointed. Huh? Disappointed. Disappointed. Let's do one more. Sad. Sad. Sad, disappointed, frustrated. I would be frustrated if I was ready to go home. What do you think someone could do for Lizzie? Just make a little room for Faith. There we go. Give Lizzie a present. Give her a present? Maybe the nurse's station has a toy or something they can give her. All right, so I have one more person and one more person's shoes, and these shoes belong to Abigail. Abigail has been pregnant for 10 months, and she is ready to have the baby. She's driving to the hospital, well, her husband's driving to the hospital, and she's getting ready to have her baby. I know those are big shoes for you guys to fill because it's an adult, but what do you think she would be feeling? Go ahead. Um, She'll be feeling... um. Sad and hurt? She might be in pain a little bit, but she's about to have her first baby. Happy. Happy. Excited. 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 Let's do one more. Excited and worried. Excited and worried. You're right. And what? Bored? Well, excited and worried, maybe a little bit bored because there's a lot of waiting that goes on. And what do you think that someone in the hospital could do to help her? What do you think would help her? Nurse. A nurse. Well, lucky you, I am one. Huh? And a doctor. And a doctor. Okay. So we could maybe tell her what to expect, right? We're going to take you into this room. These are the medications we're going to give you. And this is what you can expect. And I will be with you all along the way. So are those little jobs or big jobs helping someone feel? Sometimes people would say that's just a little thing, right? You're just talking to them. So what's something that Jesus did that some people would say, that's not a very important job, but it helped them feel loved and cared for? I saw a hand over here, Faith. What's something Jesus did that people might think is not a big job? Washing people's feet. Exactly. He washed the feet of his disciples, right? And people may think that that's not an important job, but that's a really important job. So let me tell you, I am a nurse, and sometimes the biggest things I could do for someone is hold their hand, tell them it's going to be okay. Sometimes I would give them a bath if they needed a bath or help them to the bathroom. Or what if you were in a hospital bed and you couldn't get up to get food or drink? You think someone could bring you food? So there's little things like that that we do, and then there's bigger things that we do, like give medications and um, help to work with the doctors to make you feel better. So my last question to you is, what are some of the things you can do for someone in your life, maybe your mom, because it's Mother's Day, to help them feel loved and cared for? You have one here? Give them hugs and kisses. Give them hugs and kisses, yes. Give flowers to them. Give flowers. Um, help them to do laundry. Help them to do laundry. That's a good one. Did you hear that one? We're going to help to do laundry. One more. Uh, kiss. Oh, we're going to give them kisses. Okay, well, thank you, boys and girls, for listening to our story. And this week, I want you to remember, put yourself in someone else's shoes, whatever they're feeling, and see what you can do to help them, okay? Just like Jesus. Thank you.
Good morning, church family. I have the Marmo family here with me this morning. Melissa is not new to this community. She actually grew up at this community and went to Loma Linda Academy from fourth grade on. And her mom is one of the teachers at the academy and her dad works at the university. This is Greg, and Greg went to Riverside Christian School, and together Melissa and Greg met in college while they fell in love. And in 2019, they got married. And last year, their lives changed because beautiful little Wesley came to join them. Their lives also changed because they became a military family. And Greg joined the Air Force as an officer of biomedical engineering. They have recently relocated to Louisiana to the air base there. But today we celebrate little Wesley Joseph. He is such a joy and very, very much loved. When Greg and Melissa brought him to Sabbath school, I have to say Wesley was just a little tiny itty bitty thing, and not that I'm counting, but I think there were like six or seven adults trailing behind. So he's very loved. Immediately I found a, a kindred spirit between him because we share a birthday. And on May 5, he turned one years old. He is so sweet. And you know, Melissa and Greg, you have a big job with little Wesley. You know, part of mentoring your child is taking that opportunity, taking the rhythms of life and making God relevant to him in all the little things. Whether it's showing gratitude before a meal, whether it's um, putting him to bed with a bedtime story, you have an opportunity to pass on your faith to your child and the next generation. But you can't do it alone. And you have wonderful family who are here to support you, whether you're here locally in this community or further away. And I would love for the family to stand at this time. This is part of your support, and you also have the rest of the church family. Thank you, you may be seated. Now, Melissa and Greg wrote a beautiful message for Wesley that I would like to share with you this morning. Our dearest Wesley, today we bring you in front of our family, our friends, and above all, our God, to dedicate you to him. This is a day we have talked about since the day you were born, and we are so overjoyed that it is finally happening. Raising you within a church community is something that is very important to us, and we hope that you will grow one day. You will see how beautiful a church family and fellowship can be. We have found peace, love, and support during some of our toughest times these last few years. We can only pray with you and for you that God will guide you with every decision that you make. Your journey with God is very personal, and if you allow him to lead, you will never fail. Just like how Isaiah 40, 31 says about growing wings like an eagle, they shall run and not grow weary, we hope that it is the case for you too. No matter the decisions that you make or the mistakes you make, my son, we will always love you and guide you when needed. We love you dearly, Wesley. Love mom and dad. So beautiful. Well, I would like to see if Wesley will come to me. <laughs> we practiced this earlier. He's very much a mama's boy. He loves his mommy, so maybe it's better if he just stays with her. 
Let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for this dear sweet family who has the task of raising little Wesley, but Lord, they don't do it alone. They have family and they have you. May you be their guide, may you give Greg and Melissa wisdom as they train little Wesley to love you, to give his heart to you. We just ask a special blessing on them now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I wish you God's richest blessings on your family. So Helen, Helen has a long history with our church because she was married here many years ago. And now she's also celebrating another milestone moment here with us. Helen, uh, she grew up in an Adventist family as a PK and she committed to following Jesus when she was young. She served God faithfully in many different roles as a VBS director, as a Sabbath school teacher, as a head deaconess of her church, and also um, as, as a missionary in the mission field. And in, throughout her life, she has witnessed God's power moving so powerfully, but most clearly through her oldest son, Ryan, who was born with a partial brain, but an extra large heart. And through his witness, 14, 14 people decided to follow Jesus. So powerful. And despite all of that, there was a part of her that felt like something was missing, that she was holding something back. Um, and it's only in recent, it, recently that she has um, wholeheartedly developed a personal, deep relationship with Jesus. And so to mark that occasion, she's chosen to be rebaptized today. I know there's a lot of people um, who have been a part of your spiritual journey. Advent Hope, the Advent Hope community has helped her to grow spiritually. And she also has family who are watching through the broadcast and here today. So if you are the family and friends of Helen, I invite you to stand right now. Wow. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you for being her spiritual family, supporting her through her journey. Um, and we'll continue to support her as she moves forward. You may be seated. So Helen, because you have chosen to follow God wholeheartedly and to bury that old half-hearted self and to begin again anew with Jesus, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I am joined in the baptismal tank with a very special young woman. This is Rachel Havor, the only daughter of Gina and Ed Havor. Her brother Nathan is here. And she has lots of grandparents and a whole lot of friends that love Rachel. Now Rachel was, um, she was a, a, a child of this church all of her life. And people knew that she was very shy and that she didn't say it very much. But she has changed that now. She's a, a talker. In fact, mom says she's not shy anymore. And I love it when Rachel came to leadership in junior high. She's in eighth grade at Loma Linda, uh, Loma Linda Academy. And she is an early adopter. I said, Rachel, I like that you're an early adopter. When we have an idea or I need somebody to prime the pump, you're the first to, ra to raise your hand and volunteer. In fact, just last night, we held a worship service at Loma Linda Valley Villa, and Rachel got up and testified to her God before her peers and before all of those wonderful friends at the villa. I was so proud, I started to get emotional, because this is the young lady who was so shy that she didn't want to say much. And I am so excited. You saw her last Sabbath playing her violin. She's been playing violin since second grade. 
She takes her studies very seriously. She takes her friends very seriously. In fact, so serious, she had to bury one in the sand when we went to the beach, and then she let that friend bury her in the sand, and I have pictures to, to prove it. She's very, very fun. So I am very excited that her family and friends are here to support her decision in Jesus. She understands that to be baptized is a symbolic gesture a demonstration to the Lord of faith that we die to the old person of sin and are reborn in Jesus Christ, and she wants to do that. Can I have her friends and family stand right now in support of Rachel? Oh, come over here. You may be seated. Rachel, you love Jesus, and you declare it as often as you can. And I appreciate so much that you are so involved in leadership. It gives me great joy to baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That never gets old for a youth pastor. We have many young people who are thinking about baptism. We might have adults and seniors who are thinking about baptism. We'd like to invite you to speak with one of the pastors if you want to continue your journey into discipleship of our Lord.
Happy Sabbath, church. Today's scripture is found on Luke 7, uh, 36 through 43. Uh, we are reading from the New in International Version. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him and saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Being a healthcare worker is hard work, no matter the area you work in. You often work long hours, odd hours, hard hours. You see us at our worst and help us get to our best. And a lot of times you're not really appreciated. Well, you're appreciated here at Loma Linda University Church and Anthem. We see you, we appreciate you, and on behalf of us, we want to express our sincere gratitude for the tireless and selfless work you do every day. Your dedication and commitment to helping others, especially during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, have been truly inspiring. You're the unsung heroes of our society, risking your own health and safety to care for others. Your hard work and sacrifices have not gone unnoticed, and we appreciate the tremendous effort you put in to ensure that your patients receive the best possible care. Your kindness, compassion, and professionalism have touched countless lives and your tireless efforts have saved many. You've shown us the true meaning of service. Thank you for your courage, your compassion, and your unwavering commitment to your patients and your communities. You are truly our heroes. To make man whole. That's what it said at the top of the letter that I received when I was in college, but forgive me if I wasn't paying much attention to it, my eyes immediately went down to the body of the letter because I was anticipating this letter and it said and it announced that I had been accepted at the Loma Linda University School of Medicine. Happy Sabbath, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm a pulmonary and critical care specialist, also sleep specialist, and I've been working in the area for a long time. And yes, the last two to three years have been busy. But I'm, I'm much more than that. I'm a, a son of this church, of this community, of this denomination. And the reason is, is because about 40 years ago, my mother and father, happy Mother's Day, Mom, by the way, decided at the age of 40 that my father was gonna come to dental school. So he moved our whole family from Toronto, Canada to Loma Linda. Um, and me, at the age of nine, I remember it, distinctly walked in that door on a day just like today into this church and my life was changed. Because you see, I got involved with everything. I was in the junior choir. I was in the collegiate choir. I was in Pathfinders. I was on the media ministry. Our whole family was involved in the media ministry. In fact, when we went on vacation, we had to coordinate that with the church. Otherwise, there would be nobody running the cameras that week. Um, in, in high school, our youth pastor was Doug Mace. <laughs> I'm telling you, Doug Mace is, is raising the spiritual seeds in his second generation. It's, a, it's amazing to see Doug. Um, I remember as soon as I walked into the church, the first thing that drew my attention was the pipes. And I said, you know what? I want to play that one day. And uh, my brother and I both got organ lessons with chemo. And uh, if you remember us playing, it's probably my brother that you remember. I played a few postludes. So the point is, is that I've done 
just about all of the aspects of a church service except give a sermon for the last 40 years. So here I am. I finally arrived. <laughs> Love Pastor Randy. When, we, when my wife and I, by the way, happy Mother's Day, Betty. Um, when our, my wife and I got married, we had an existential crisis because you see my wife is a physician, but she's also a member, she was also a member of the Corona Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the senior pastor of the, of the Corona Seventh-day Adventist Church was Randy Roberts. And so the question was, is where are we going to go to church after we get married? I've said, of course, I've been a member here at the university church, this is where we have to go. And she's like, but we love Pastor Randy's sermons down at Corona. And so Randy married us, and uh, you know, we, we went to him to counsel in this very severe issue that first came up as soon as we got married. And you know, Randy took his job as a marriage and family counselor very seriously. And so therefore, you can thank us for having Randy Roberts here as a senior pastor at this church. <laughs> okay, I may be exaggerating that a little bit. Um, our three kids were born here at the medical center. Nicole, my oldest, uh, she is uh, 18. Last year, she gave the prayer conference here at the university church. She was actually the, one of the sermons, and she, she likes to rub it in that she got here to the pulpit before I did, um, Dad. So just remember that. She also is telling me that she likes to go into medicine. She'd like to go into medicine someday. And I'm hoping, of course, that she decides to come to my alma mater, Loma Linda University, here to go to School of Medicine. Because, and I told her, look, you've got a better shot of it when someone who's related to you has gone through before you and made a good impression. And I'm, I'm hoping I made a good impression. I can see actually some of my attendings out there. I see Dr. Evans there and uh, it's a few of the nurses. Um, so about two months ago, you have to understand, when Randy called me and said, hey, could you give this sermon on May 13? I said, of course, very calmly, yes, yes, I would be happy to do that. And then I hang up the phone and I turn to the first person next to me who was Nicole, my eldest daughter, and said, you're never gonna believe this. I'm giving the sermon on May 13. And she said, she just very calmly just put her hand on me and said, Dad, you're gonna be fine. I said, well, why, why am I gonna be fine, Nicole? Why do you think so? And she said, Dad, you know, you've got a better shot of it when someone who's related to you <laughs> has gone through before you and has made a good impression. <laughs> so I said, okay, Nicole, thank you. Let's, let's bow our heads as we, as we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for allowing us to be here on this Healthcare Provider Week, also on, on Mother's Day tomorrow. Help us to open the word and to understand more about what it is to make man whole and to heal. In thy name, amen. So today's message is not just for physicians, not just for nurses, PAs, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, occupational therapists, all of the things that we graduate from this campus. And I want to disabuse you of this idea that when we walk around the campus, we can look at the medical center and we say, this is where we heal people physically. And then come to the church and say, this is where we heal people spiritually. Because we should be doing both in both buildings. I don't believe that God wants us to make man whole by having different disciplines at a university level. I think that's good but I think we need to have different disciplines down to the individual provider level. I think we need to realize, and this is what we're gonna talk about today, is that us in the medical profession, dental profession, the healing arts, are not completely doing, we're doing a job that needs to be done, but we're not doing the complete job if all we think we need to do is heal people physically. We're all trained very well to heal physically. My education here at Loma Linda was second to none. But I believe that we're neglecting a great work when we refrain from ministering in these lines of work, specifically the mental and the spiritual, and leave that singularly to somebody else. And despite the fact that I'm trying to do more, I don't think that I've reached my pinnacle either. I think there's more that I can do, and it's not just the physical healing. So the question is, is should we pay, pray for our patients? You know, we have come a long way since the rational 20th century. Actually, we coined the term here at Loma Linda, whole person care. And currently, in the state of California, the California Department of Healthcare Services has actually adopted that term into their own pilot programs. They want to make sure that healthcare providers are providing whole patient care. But, 
As Dr. Peter Ubel, a physician and author at Duke University, says about a neurosurgeon who once offered in an unsolicited prayer to an atheistic patient about to undergo surgery, he said, it was wrong for that neurosurgeon to preach at his patient's bedside without first inquiring about his patient's spirituality. It is equally wrong for physicians to act as if patients' spiritual beliefs have no relevance in their medical care. This is coming from the mainstream medical community. Today, think about this, today we live in a world more shattered than ever before with guilt, lack of forgiveness, no confidence of our salvation. The sick are constantly on edge and fearful about what's gonna happen to them in terms of their not only eternal life, but also their physical life, and I see that in the intensive care unit. For us to continue to minister to only the physical needs of patients would be a huge missed opportunity. I have a friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Axa Martell. She's a hospitalist that works here in the old hospital. And in the old hospital, they used to have rooms with multiple beds. One day, she was taking care of one of her patients. And at the end of examining them, she prayed with that patient. And as she was leaving, one of the other patients had overheard and said, are, are, Doctor, are you my doctor too? To which she said, no, I'm not. Uh, and then the patient said, can you pray with me as well? Once patients understand what they can get, and what needs are met when we stop for just a moment and pray with them, the world opens. It changes the environment. Dr. Brian Schwartz, who used to be the president of the Adventist Medical Evangelism Network, tells a story where he, as a cardiologist in Kettering, Ohio, would pray with his patients. And one day, a Muslim physician came up to him and said, Brian, you know, when you pray with your patients, it makes me want to be a better Muslim. This elevation in, in the, the dialogue of prayer in the patient's room is something else. Um, I know that there's been many, many articles that have been published. I know that Dr. Razouk here in the medical center wrote a nice article about praying with his patients in the last edition of the Loma Linda University School of Medicine alumni journal, and I would uh, invite you to do that. It gets to the point almost, almost like peer pressure. There was one time when I was seeing a patient in my pulmonary clinic, um, and obviously a lot of my pulmonary patients also have heart problems, and, and he was, happened to be seeing a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Thomas Mikowski, who's a cardiologist and does a lot of interventions. He always prays with his patients, and, and I knew that, and this was early on when I was just getting into this, and I knew at the end of my visit, the patient was there and said, you know, looking at me, doctor, you know, Dr. Thomas Mikowski, he always prays with his patients. And I knew I wasn't getting out of that room unless I prayed with that patient. So, once people start to realize that this is something that we can do, they love it. And this is not to take away from chaplains and people who are, who are educated on this campus in the non-medical healing ways. So for instance, chaplains and ministers and pastors. But there, there's something about knowing that the person who is in charge of your medical care is also in tune with the spiritual needs of that patient. The founder of our institution, Ellen G. White, said this about this topic. My brethren, the Lord calls for unity, for oneness. We are to be one in the faith. I want to tell you that when the gospel ministers and the medical missionary workers are not united, there is placed in our churches the worst evil that can be placed there. Our medical missionaries ought to be interested in the work of our conferences and our conference workers ought to be as much interested in the work of our medical missionaries. This is really important. Look at that statement there at the end. Our conference workers ought to be as much interested in the work of our medical missionaries. You know, we have a tradition on this campus of combining the ethics and the medical. Jack Provencher both was a ordained minister and a, 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 a physician. And uh, this is something that I believe should not be combined just in a university, but also some people have actually gone to that extent to actually be trained in both. It's not necessary, but I know some people who have been members of the cloth and had later in life have gone back to medical school. I see uh, Dr. David Bre Westbrook, almost Dr. David Westbrook. He's gonna be a doctor soon. He's doing that right now. It's not for everybody, but it's, it's there. What are we doing in the church for, in terms of this? The conference workers ought to be as much interested in the work of our medical missionaries. Things like New Start from Weimar University, things like CHIP programs. This is what we do in the church because we're interested in the medical mission service. As many of you know, I have a, a, a YouTube channel called MedCram where we would educate patients, educate people 
on uh, medical topics. And then when the pandemic came around, we discussed things of general medical interest, but we also started to talk about some of the natural healing remedies as well, like getting enough sleep, making sure that you're drinking enough water, getting rest, uh, eating the right kind of diet. And, and as a result of that, we reached 1.5 million subscribers. People are very interested in how to make themselves more healthy. What I didn't realize is that the Crown Prince of Bahrain was one of the people watching. And very early in the pandemic, we talked about testing, we talked about medicines, and because it was a small country with a lot of resources and not a lot of red tape, they were actually able to act on that information and, unbeknownst to me, use that as part of their COVID-19 policy. Well, after the pandemic, I had gotten a call from the Prime Minister's office, who's also the Crown Prince, and uh, wanting to have a meeting. Well, to make a long story short, he told us that he wanted to award uh, the founders of MedCram a medal. So we flew out to Washington, D.C. and received the medal. But before I did, I got some help from our community. I never want to have an opportunity like this go to waste. And um, Grace Elias was able to get for us a bound leather Arabic translation of Desire of Ages. And so in my library sits a medal from the Crown Prince of Bahrain, and in his library is, is a translation of Desire of Ages. Praise God. And this is what I'm talking about with the first part of this, which is our medical missionaries ought to be interested in the work of our conferences. And that's what I want to focus on today. This hit home for me one day when I was in the ICU and I was taking care of a patient. And this patient had overdosed on metformin, which is a diabetic medication. And when someone is in renal failure, as he was, it basically converts uh, lots of lactic acid. Uh, it makes lots of lactic acid. This patient was so um, sick that his pH was actually less than 7.0. He was going into cardiac arrest. We couldn't even ventilate him appropriately to keep him alive. We had to uh, have the respiratory therapist bag with the ABU bag to try to get off enough carbon dioxide manually for an hour or two while I placed the dialysis catheter in, put the patient on dialysis. We were praying for his physical healing. And it was as if they, he was the only patient in the intensive care unit. And uh, boy, his, his lactic, normal lactic acid levels are about two, his were 30. I'd never seen a level that high. I, I've never been so happy to see a lactic acid level of 20 about uh, 12 hours later, and I knew we were in the right direction. And to make a long story short, we saved his life. And I was so happy. It was as if we were giving each other high fives that we had pulled through as a team. And the next day and the day after, when I went to go back to see him out of, after he was in the intensive care unit, he was more depressed then than he was when he had come in because he realized that he was not successful in committing suicide. And that's when I realized that you can be as adept as possible. You can do everything correctly. You can treat the patient physically. It's necessary but not sufficient. And this is the, this is the point that I want to make is that we, when we separate the spiritual and the physical, we're not treating the whole patient. So I started to not merely talk about prayer and healing physical, but also spiritually. We have so many of those who are longing for spiritual and mental healing with the guilt and uncertainty in our lives. Reference what we've had here in the last month or two with the QR codes and the people that have asked these questions. I have never realized that I, that I am sitting in the same pew with people who are not secure in the understanding of whether or not they have been forgiven. Forgiveness of sin in our lives is so necessary for the healing process to happen. For many, they are not sure of it. It's more, it's more powerful than actual physical healing. When someone is, feels like they are forgiven, a weight is lifted from them. And a new countenance is manifested, and they believe that they're actually forgiven. So there was an interesting study that was done in 2001. Dr. Neil Krauss out of the University of Michigan and Dr. Christopher Ellison out of the University of Texas in Austin, and he sent out 1,500 surveys. Now, what they were looking for in this survey was a survey about forgiveness, and there was two types of forgiveness that they were interested in looking at. The first type of forgiveness was conditional forgiveness. That means if someone does something to you, you would only forgive them if they came back and showed some, some token of contrition or said, excuse me, or something like that. That's conditional forgiveness. Unconditional forgiveness is when you forgive them regardless of what they do. In other words, they could go on their way, 
they never had to come back, you would still forgive them anyway. So they had conditional forgiveness and unconditional forgiveness. And then what they did was they sampled them in terms of other things going on in their life. And this is what they found. They found that those people who forgave conditionally have these attributes. Greater psychological distress. Diminished feelings of well-being. Higher depressed affect scores. More somatic symptoms of depression. You know what a somatic symptom is. It's a physical manifestation of depression. Belly aches, headaches, feeling malaise. Lower life satisfaction. More anxious about dying. This is something I see in my intensive care unit when I see patients. So those who forgave only conditionally had all of these attributes. And those that didn't, those that forgave unconditionally, did not have those attributes. But something that was even more interesting, something that set back the researchers even more than that, was the next thing that I'm going to share with you. And I'm going to show you what they actually wrote. Because they wanted to figure out what determined whether or not somebody would forgive conditionally or unconditionally. And this is what they found. They said, what determines unconditional forgiveness in the study? Here it is. Older people who feel they are forgiven by God are approximately, not 20%, not 50%, not even 100%, but two and a half times more likely to feel that transgressors should be forgiven unconditionally than older people who do not feel they are forgiven by God. That's a pretty high odds ratio. Almost it implies causation. So what you have here is if somebody understands that they are forgiven by God, that they have sinned, that they repent, and they know that they've been forgiven by God, they are more likely to forgive others unconditionally, and guess what? They miss out on greater psychological distress, diminished feelings of well-being, higher depressed affect scores, more somatic symptoms of depression, lower life satisfaction, and being more anxious about dying. So we have two problems. The two problems are this. There are those who do not realize their condition and are not forgiven as a result they miss out of the benefit of the forgiveness of sin. Then there are those that do realize their condition and have either not asked for forgiveness or they have and they still are not convinced that they are forgiven. And these are the patients that roll in time after time after time with the baggage, with the baggage of sin. And what do we do as healthcare providers? I can tell you as a critical care doctor, if somebody comes in in septic shock, my first job in addition to resuscitating them is finding the source. It's called source control. Find out where the infection is and cut it out. Start the antibiotics, find the abscess. What we're seeing here, based on the science, is that the real source of much of this disease is this understanding that they're not forgiven by God. And this is maybe the real source. It's as if I'm looking at a CAT scan and I'm trying to find in the CAT scan where the abscesses are so I can have them drained rather than just treating them and throwing them out. Do we get to the underlying source or not? To get the most benefit from praying, we should not just pray for their physical healing, but make sure that they believe they, they undergo treatment, that they are fully aware of the forgiveness of God in their lives whatever it is that they actually have done. And this is exactly what the science would indicate. So the science is indicating that if you want to have better outcomes, make sure that your patients are not harboring understanding of unforgiven sin. Do you see this? Okay, so based on this, it wouldn't be surprising for Ellen White to write this in the Ministry of Healing under the chapter, Prayer for the Sick. That's what she says. To those who desire prayer for their restoration to health, how many want restoration of health? It should be made plain that the violation of God's law, either natural or spiritual, is sin. And that in order for them to receive his blessing, sin must be confessed and forsaken. When wrong things have been righted, we may present the needs of the sick to the Lord in calm faith. His spirit may, in, as his spirit may indicate, he knows each individual by name, and cares for each as if there were not another upon the earth for whom he gave his beloved son. Because God's love is so great and so unfailing, the sick should be encouraged to trust in him and be cheerful. 
So do we have an example of this in the Bible? Certainly, if this is a truism, we should see an example of this in the Bible. And in fact, the answer is yes. And if we look at towards the end of Christ's healing and teaching ministry, we see an event that exemplifies exactly what we've been talking about today, and it's Simon's Feast. At Simon's Feast, there are two characters that exemplify the two dichotomy, or the dichotomy by, both by contrast and comparison to what is happening. So who are the two guests? Number one, Simon. He's the host. Who is Simon? Simon is a powerful Pharisee who was physically healed of leprosy, a deadly disease, but did not fully understand his full condition and his need for a savior. Sitting at the table, not giving Christ the kiss, but interested to hear more. This is what Desire of Ages says. Simon of Bethany was accounted a disciple of Jesus. He was one of the few Pharisees who had openly joined Christ's followers. He acknowledged Jesus and as a teacher and hoped that he might be the Messiah, but he had not accepted him as a savior. You have to be in trouble to have a savior. If you don't feel you're in trouble, you don't need a savior. His character was not transformed. His principles were unchanged. Simon had been healed of the leprosy, and it was this that had drawn him to Jesus. He desired to show his gratitude, and at Christ's last visit to Bethany, he made a feast for the Savior and his disciples. So this is an interesting story, because this story is recorded by all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written very early in the Christian period, so probably at the same time as the second person in this story was still alive, and that is the woman the sinful woman, as it says in Luke, and we heard today during the scripture reading. What do we know about this woman? Well, we know actually a little bit more once we can connect the dots, because the last gospel is the gospel of John, and John also records about this topic, this, this uh, event, but John was written much later, around 90 to 100 AD. John was very old, when he wrote his gospel. And this took place when he was a teenager, many, many years before. It was very likely that this woman was no longer alive. And as such, John could tell us a little bit more about the identity of who this woman was. And he does so. Who was this woman? He writes in John 12, verse three, then took Mary, a pound of ointment and spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus. It was Mary of Bethany. Now, if we read the four accounts, and we read the Zire of Ages, and we start connecting the dots, we start to find things that are really interesting. We start to find out that Mary of Bethany was very likely Mary Magdalene, the same person, and also very likely the woman caught in the act of adultery. But not only that, but that Simon was her uncle, and the one that actually led her into sin, and that Judas was the son of Simon, and therefore her cousin. And what you start to realize is that this is really one messed up family. <laughs> but does it sound familiar? And yet Jesus is in the midst of them, ministering to them. Starts to put a couple of dots together in your mind. You always wonder, why were there so many Pharisees at Lazarus' funeral? Or why did, how did Judas know where to go when the Pharisees were hiding on the night that Jesus was betrayed? Or how did the Pharisees know that the woman was actually in the act before they brought her to Jesus? These are questions that always linger, but if you put all of this together, you start to see. And what you start to find out is that this woman who was at the feet of Jesus at Simon's feast was forgiven and understood that she was forgiven. And this is the explanation for why she was different than Simon. Listen to what John says in chapter eight. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So we can see with this formula for a true and complete healing, this is how the healing ministry of Jesus Christ is to make man whole. Desire of Ages once again. Mary had been looked upon as a great sinner 
but Christ knew the circumstances that had shaped her life. He might have extinguished every spark of hope in her soul, but he did not. It was he who had lifted her from despair and ruin. Seven times she had heard his rebuke of the demons that controlled her heart and mind. She had heard his strong cries to the Father in her behalf. She knew how offensive is sin to his unsullied purity, and in his strength she had overcome. When to human eyes her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. The plan of redemption had invested humanity with great possibilities. And in Mary, these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace, she became a partaker in the divine nature, the one who had fallen, the one whose mind had been a habitation of demons, was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship in ministry. It was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. It was Mary who poured upon his head the precious anointing of oil and bathed his feet with her tears. Mary stood beside the cross and followed him to the sepulcher. Mary was the first at the tomb after his resurrection. It was Mary who first proclaimed a risen savior. Notice the difference between these two. One healed physically with a casual interest. The other healed at the deepest levels. Yes, Christ stopped them from throwing stones. It was the first instance of prophylactic medication, right? It's important. He met her physical needs at that moment. But that's not where he ended. He went in and went to the root cause, which was to forgive her sin. Forgive her sin. And that is why we see Mary at the feet of Jesus and not hosting a dinner party. And that is the, that is the difference. When we join hands with the Savior to truly heal, when the right arm of the gospel, the medical missionary work, is joined with the rest of the body of Christ, when our burden is to heal all aspects of our patients' lives and provide true care, the result will be Mary instead of Simon. But, but even Simon was gently converted by Christ once he was made aware that he owed 500 and not 50. He thought he owed 50, and she owed 500. But when Christ showed him that he was the one that owed 500, he realized, and instead of him reading Jesus, Jesus was now reading him. And so we have a number of issues. There are some of us here who are Simons, needing to understand that we owe Christ 500 and not 50. We are needing the transforming spirit of God. We need to be convicted of what we have done and be transformed not only physically, but mentally and spiritually. And then there are some of us here who are Mary. We feel as though we are too sinful. We feel as though we are beyond hope of salvation. But we understand that Christ has paid the 500 and we respond with the spikenard. But we should know that we are forgiven and that we should forgive others. Jesus knows the circumstances of every soul. You may say, I am sinful, very sinful. You may be. But the worse you are, the more you need Jesus. He turns no weeping, contrite one away. He does not tell to any all that he might reveal. But he bids every trembling soul to take courage. Freely will he pardon all who came to him for forgiveness and restoration. Dr. John Shin, class of 2014 and current president of Amen, wrote this article in the recent edition of the Alumni Journal titled, Steps to Effective Spiritual Care. And I think it's a great article if you want to read this. Out, he outlines seven steps that we as healthcare providers can do to make sure we bring that to our patients. Number one, to bear fruit, we must be connected to the vine. So we need to make sure that we are connected to the vine on a daily basis. Number two, spiritual care must be spirit-led. So we need to invite the Holy Spirit into us if we want to imbue it into our patients. Number three, prayerfully look for opportunities to conduct spiritual care. When your patients are talking to you about 
philosophically how things are going on in their life. When they're looking at it from the 30,000 foot view, that's when you can come in and talk to them. Engage in spiritual conversation with them to see if they want to reciprocate. If appropriate, or act when we, when we are impressed, number five is act when we feel impressed to act. So you will get a sense, this has happened to me when I've talked to patients, I'll get the sense that I need to intervene, that the, that the patient needs this. Watch for this. This is, what, this is a skill that you can build as a healthcare provider. If appropriate, end with prayer. Not every interaction with patients need to end in prayer, okay? Make sure that you are using it when you think it is necessary. And then finally, number seven, document your spiritual encounter so that the next time you see that patient, you'll know where you can pick up. Dr. Gerald Winslow, Director Emeritus of the Center for Christian Bioethics here at Loma Linda University said this, wholeness means the lifelong harmonious development of the physical, intellectual, emotional, relational, cultural, and spiritual dimensions of a person's life, unified through a loving relationship with God and expressed in generous service to others. If we are going to carry out the mission of Loma Linda University, Indeed, Christianity, to continue the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus Christ, we must pray with and for our patients, not just for physical healing, but also to make sure they get the full benefit of the transformation of the body, mind, and soul. And we do this to make man whole. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for opening your word and showing us what it is that you have asked us to do. We live in a world that reminds us every day that the wages of sin is disease and death. But please help us to understand that the forgiveness of sin leads to health and even eternal life. Help us to demonstrate that to our patients, using words when necessary. In thy name, amen. Please remain seated for the postlude.
Hello, everybody. Some of you have commented about how much you are blessed by the services at University Church. I'd like to take this opportunity to encourage you to invite your friends to join us Sabbath by Sabbath at University Church. Right at the top of my list is Richard Blum Johnston, good friend and wonderful brother right here at University Church. In fact, he is the first elder of the church and marking a birthday. Congratulations, Richard. We appreciate your faithfulness, your effectiveness so much. Raleigh Heald lives in Tucson, Arizona. This is his 92nd birthday. Congratulations, sir, and glad to see you there with wife Ginger on the occasion of your 50th anniversary. Hello, Stephanie Tamanaha, right here in Riverside, and so glad to greet you for your birthday and see you with your two darling daughters, Vivi and Violet. Steve Webb, Apopka, Florida, 59th birthday, Steve. Glad to be reminded, congratulations, and glad to see you with your dad, Jim. Art and Esther Nelson, Pleasant Plains, Illinois. And we go back to Walla Walla College. Congratulations to both of you on your birthday, Esther's a little earlier, then Art, and also the two of you are so blessed. Ron Benfield, Spokane, Washington. Hello, Ron, happy birthday. Your varied life, including a musician, is so encouraging. Glad to see you with Joyce, and there you are with grandchildren. Hello, Scott Katie, Meridian, Idaho. So glad to see you the other day and wish you all the best for your birthday. And glad to see you with Michelle and yes, that canine child. Mimi Lowe, Conover, North Carolina. Happy birthday, Mimi. Glad to see you with your granddaughters, I think, and then with husband, Don. Happy birthday, William Murdoch, Dr. Bill. So glad to see you with Jeannie and you really fit that red sports car. Angie Armstrong, Keene, Texas. Graduation from Southwestern Adventist University. Congratulations, Angie, and glad to see you there with mother and sister and with husband Keith and more family. Norma Osborne, Marina Valley, part of our family right here at University Church. Thank you for letting me know about your birthday. There you are with oldest granddaughter, Justine, I think. And then, of course, with Dick. Carolyn McCann, right here in this community. 91st birthday, I believe. And glad to see you with Kathy, Steve, and Nancy. Gwendolyn Christensen, so glad to be reminded of your birthday, Gwendolyn. And I chose this picture with you and Brother Fred, who was a great friend. We miss him so much, but congratulations for your birthday, Gwen. Jacqueline Lynch Lawrence, Huntsville, Alabama. Once a part of our pastoral staff and glad to know about your birthday, Jacqueline, and see you there with husband Latham. Jimmy Loader, happy birthday, lady, and glad to see you with Brother Bob. Robert Matthews. Yes, we call ourselves cousins. And there he is, a part of the community at the Convalescent Center and proud to be recognized in his residency there. Tony Anobly, Keene, Texas. No, I guess it's really Burleson's where you're working anyway. Congratulations on your birthday with wife Shana. Yes, 60-year-old brother-like friend to Jim Pedersen. Linda and Stu Harty, 33rd anniversary. Congratulations, you two. There they were, and yes, there you are, and what a family you have. Linda and her sister Karen Soderblom share the same birth date, and they love each other so much and have a great time. Ed Keyes, Phoenix, Arizona, president of the Arizona Conference, good friend there with one of his pastor, Bobby McGee, and then with dear Lillian. Hello, Don Vollmer. Glad to be reminded of your birthday, of course, part of the Wedgwood Trio, and there you are with dear Melinda. Phil Mothersbaugh, College Place, Washington, 
Man, it was nice to see you just the other day. Happy birthday, Phil, and glad to see you with Debbie. Keith Colburn, another longtime friend. We go back to Eugene, Oregon. And happy birthday, Keith, and glad to see you with Janine. Greetings, Dorothy Brooks. Happy birthday, lady. Glad to see you there with your family and Chris. You know, I learned first about your birthday from our mutual friend, the late Brian McCorkle. And that gives me such warm feelings to remember him. Hello, Mike and Susie Potts out Camarillo Way. Happy anniversary, you too. Glad to be in touch with you all the time. Congratulations. John and Pam McVeigh, College Place, Washington, up Walla Walla University Way. So glad to be with you folks recently. Now you're marking your 43rd anniversary, I understand. And you were once young. And then your children grew up, and now there are three generations. Congratulations. Yara Salum, Redlands, California. Happy birthday, lady. Always glad to be reminded. And Esther Knott, a part of the ministerial department stationed at Berrien Springs, Michigan. Happy birthday, care Esther, and glad to see you with Ron. Robert, Dr. Bob Wagner, happy birthday, sir. Yes, you were once a handsome young guy, and you still are, and much loved, and a proud granddad. Hello, Carolina Davis, right here, Loma Linda. Sorry I'm a little late, but a very happy birthday to you. Another week, we're blessed. Thank you so much for being a part of our fellowship.